Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Farmer Greg here, and welcome to the 380th episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where every day we work together to educate and inspire you to become part of your food revolution. Do you want to save money at the grocery store, eat more organic, whole foods, cultivate food security, and feel more connected to the earth? If so, then growing your own food is a no-brainer. You wouldn't believe how many people come to me claiming that they can't grow their own food. They think they don't have enough space, that they're too busy, or that they simply don't have what it takes. Perhaps you've fallen for one of these gardening myths. If you think you can't grow food, or if you think the only food that you have access to is what you buy in the grocery store, I have a life-changing webinar that you need to see. It's free and will help you unearth your inner gardener. I've helped thousands of people just like you learn to grow their own food and I'm speaking from my own experience when I say that with the right knowledge in place, there is no such thing as a black thumb. With this webinar, you can begin making your garden dreams come true and start growing delicious, nutritious food for your family. Just text GARDEN to 44222 or go to IWantToGarden.com and you will receive our free webinar about the seven key factors you need to know to grow your own food. Remember, that's GARDEN to 44222 or IWantToGarden.com. Today on our podcast, we have someone who studies the microbiology in soil and its relationships to plant life. We're talking with Derek Zellers about plant and soil health. Derek holds a Bachelor's of Science in Environmental Sciences from the University of Texas at San Antonio. He has over 13 years of combined experience in the fields of environmental microbiology, chemistry, and bioremediation. He holds two patents related to the fields, and one of his published journal articles is on the studies of microalgae after herbicide side treatments. Welcome to the show today, Derek. Are you ready to rock soil health? Yes, let's leave them in the soil. <laughs> Excellent. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at today? Yes. Growing up in the South, born and raised in Anson, Alabama, that's where I became a real enthusiast for the environment, seeing some of the chemicals that were damaging the soil, killing some of the plant life, particularly the fruit trees. It's really caused me to want to have a big bigger eye and a bigger involvement in changing our environment. How'd those seeds get planted? Well, growing up, I didn't experience any of those seeds. It was just more of observation Mm. of knowing that something is wrong. One day you see a beautiful plum tree, five years later, you don't see it. And so I wouldn't necessarily say there was someone surrounding me that would plant those seeds. It was strictly from the observation that I was able to observe. Wow. And this journey started there. How did you get from there to Phoenix, Arizona? Phoenix, Arizona. Yes. So before I arrived in Phoenix, Arizona, I did have a little brief stay in the great state of Texas. There is where I served three years into the military. Excellent. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. And after leaving the military, that's where I started my educational career in academia. It's where I've received my degree at the University of Texas at San Antonio. Pretty much basically after graduation, I decided that there was two states that I could actually move to. One was being Alabama back home and the other was being Arizona. And I definitely thought about that beautiful sunshine regardless of the heat. And that's how I ended up in Phoenix, Arizona. Well, cool. All right. So let's get into to soil health. Yes. How is our soil becoming more depleted? Our soils are becoming more depleted. It's because of one, the lack of education. We have to understand that plants were here before us. Trees were here before us. Microorganisms were here before humans. So therefore, they have been able to sustain on their own. Once we have come into the picture, we have this interpretation that the soil needs to be fed constantly, that you have to apply nutrients. You have to apply a large amount of nutrients. You have to apply concentrated amount of nutrients in order for that plant root system to absorb. And that has totally led to some of the depletion of our soils, the contamination of our water systems. All right. So that doesn't quite make sense to me that the overuse of fertilizers has led to 
our soil getting depleted? That is correct. And here's why. There's things that go on in the soil that we cannot see. And there's something that's called a binding, that you have free minerals, free nutrients that are in your soil solution. These are the very nutrients that are going to be absorbed by the root system. That system is designed on its own. The plant is going to release some sugars for the bacteria species that live around its rhizosphere and its root system. In return, that bacteria is going to feed off of those sugars and also break down the minerals that are attached to the soil particle. However, when we start to add more nitrogen and more phosphorus and more potassium, we are essentially binding those nutrients and making it inaccessible for the roots to take up. In return, that is now depleting our soils. What happens to those nutrients once they get bound up? Well, when you irrigate, those nutrients are now washed away. That soil solution does not contain those free minerals that were once there, produced by the bacteria. However, we've added more binding nutrients that latches onto those nutrients and depletes the soil. Wow. So basically we're over fertilizing. We're over fertilizing. With MPK. With MPK, we're not really understanding how carbon works in the soil. We're adding a bunch of micronutrients that are not accessible and therefore they're just binding on more to the soil particles are not becoming available. All right. So what's the solution here? The solution is one, we must educate ourselves on the plant species. We must take our time. It's something that I like to say is patience. We as scientists understand that we're not going to complete an experiment in a laboratory in one day. We also know that we're not going to get a plant to go through its growth cycle in one week. So it comes down to observation, understanding, or I would say communicating with your plants. The plants are going to tell you when they're thirsty. We always go in that water. The plants are going to tell you when there's a nutrient deficiency. We go and we correct that nutrient deficiency. That's how we prevent ourselves from over fertilizing and depleting our soils. Wow. Well, and this has got to do with microorganisms as well. Let's dig into that a bit. Absolutely. So microorganisms are the life of the soil. They are very diverse, many different classes, genus, and species, and they all play a function in breaking down soil, so to say. So if you think about what bacteria is designed to do in the soil, it's designed to, one, feed itself, and it's designed to release nutrients. However, a bacteria species can't really differentiate on what's being released and what's not being released. And that's where the root system of the plant comes into place. And it's almost like they're communicating. So what we essentially do by over fertilizing is that we take that bacteria away from the root system and we're providing it a food source to feed on its own versus allowing the root system to produce escudates that will ultimately feed the bacteria. Wow. I'm trying to wrap my head around this. There's a lot going on here. Yes. I guess what I see so far is that we're over fertilizing and when we over fertilize, it shuts down the microorganisms. That is correct. Ah, okay, good. You actually want the plant itself to feed the bacteria and that's through the process of photosynthesis. So what is released in the root system is a term called escudates and normally that's your sugars. However, we have decided that we're going to start to add molasses to the soil to boost the bacteria population. And yes, that is correct. You will feed the bacteria with the molasses that you're adding to the soil, but you also take away that ability for that bacteria to feed the root system. So what's our solution here? So our solution is, like I said earlier, you definitely want to communicate. You want to observe your plants. You want to make sure that your moisture, the soil moisture, is at an optimum level, not necessarily for the plant, but also for the bacteria. If your soil is too dry, then the bacteria goes into a survival state. If there's too much moisture, then you're essentially killing off the bacteria. Understand what type of nutrients or the nutrient profile, what is the nutrients going to do for your root system? What are those nutrients ultimately doing for the bacteria? And then it comes down to patience. We have to understand that this is on a micro level, meaning that one little particle of nutrients will not be broken down overnight by a bacteria species. It could take weeks. It could take months. And so I think that's something that we have to be a 
a little bit more conscious about is how we feed the soil. It's not just how we feed the plant. So I'm sitting over here patting myself on the back because for the past couple, three years, I have been screaming in the world, sharing with everybody that our job isn't to necessarily grow healthy plants. Our job is to grow healthy soil. That is correct. (laughs) Nice. Okay. So I'm doing it right. So I guess that's got to be the next question is how do we grow healthy soil? How do we grow healthy soil is making sure that a natural system is in place. And part of that natural system is having carbon. Sometimes you can find the carbon in the form of organic matter, some inputs such as your humic acids, those things that the earth naturally gave us and that we now can re-implement back into the soil. So adding a nice layer of compost to your garden, adding a nice layer of woody mulch around your trees, that sounds like it's a good first step. It's a good first step in introducing different species of microorganisms in your soil. One would understand that bacteria will have a very, very difficult time breaking down the mulch, but however, the mulch will attract beneficial fungi, and that's going to be important in building that complete diversity in your soil. Got it. You've said fungi and and bacteria and microorganisms. What kind of microorganisms live in the soil? Can you kind of give us a quick rundown on that? And so you definitely have microorganisms that falls into the category of microscopic. That means that we can't see these microorganisms with the naked eye. And so you're definitely going to have your prokaryote, your eukaryotes, your yeast and molds. You're going to have some viruses that remain dormant. Those are all be considered microorganisms. But in the rims of what we're we're referring to in plant health, we're looking more of your beneficial bacteria. That would be more of your bacillus organisms, your pseudomonad organisms, your atenomycetes, your streptomycetes, and then even further, those can now be categorized into what they're actually doing in your soil. Some are breaking down toxins. Some are also doing nitrogen and phosphorus solubilization and fixation. Some are also releasing the potassium. Potassium is the number one mineral that gets fixed in the soil Mm. definitely need bacteria to release it wow all right cool so how can our listeners that includes me improve our soil what steps do i take so we've added organic matter compost in your soil maybe mulch on top what else can we do well definitely want to control the water input. Mm -hmm. I know that we live in Arizona, and so what we observe is just the topsoil. The moisture is evaporating out of the surface soil, so therefore we're ready to turn on the hose. But we also have to understand is that beneath the soil, microorganisms help create a micro environment, sort of say a microclimate, where they create moisture around the root tips, up and down the root system itself. And so what we're seeing is just a snapshot of our environment, but below the surface, there's plenty of moisture. So I would definitely say, along with building the proper soil and the proper inputs and amendments, that we definitely have to control our water. Yeah, manage it really well. Yes. So let's talk about your products because you run a company called High Creations and you've developed some microbial products to add to our soils. That is correct. One of our famous products that we just developed is called Actina. And Actina is a Streptomyces product. And so what makes this particular Streptomyces product different from all the other products is that we have it in a liquid form. Streptomyces is classified as a bacteria. However, It functions like a fungi. It produces mycelia and hyphae, and that's that whitish spider web that you see. Yeah. Those are associated with fungi and moles. However, this class of bacteria can also function like fungi as well. We decided to put it in this liquid form because we understand the difficulty it takes to germinate once it's been dried down. So that's called actina. That is correct. If I was going to use that, where do I find it? Right now, you can find it on our website at www.highcreations.com. You just go to the store tab and from there, it gives you instructions how to place an order and you can definitely read up about the product as well. Perfect. And how would I go about applying it? Because I'm going to get some of this from you and I'm going to start playing with it. What's the application look like? So the application is depending on the size of your property, anywhere from a quart to the acre. Basically, you take a quart of Actina and dilute it into about 10, 15 gallons of water. If you're on a flood system, you can actually just take the product and let it drip into your 
your flood irrigation. Ooh. If you are hand watering, just take a small amount, like an ounce to the gallon, and then pour it over the top of your potting plants. And really, it almost acts then like a foliar fertilizer when you're pouring it over the top, right? That is correct. The first thing it's going to do is embed itself into the soil. It's number one mechanism and job is to release nutrients for the root system to absorb. Wow. All right, cool. Actina. What else have you got? And we also redistribute some very unique fertilizers and soil amendments. We like to call it the wisdom line. And we call it the wisdom line because of the experience we have with very unique applications right. using some of the basic products that you can find on the market. We carry a fish emotions, which is our noble gills. We have a soul product, which is the ultimate chelator. It's a phobic acid. Uh-huh. You can find that in nature. It's the last organic acid that nature gives us. We have a natural kept product by the name of Essence. And that's more on the hormonal side, making sure that you can reach maximum genetic potential from your plants. Mm -hmm. We also have a dry fertilizer by the name of Life. And that's going to be just more of a maintenance. It helps you maintain your fertilizer inputs so you don't want over fertilize. Yeah. All right. So we started this conversation by saying we're over fertilizing and that and I kind of got that maybe fertilizing is a no, no, but you guys are selling a fertilizer product. So kind to bridge that gap for me. Well, so the difference is that you're looking for a fertilizer that's more in the lines of slow release. That means that those nutrients would ultimately become available as the bacteria makes them available. Oh. Those are the type of fertilizers that you're looking to apply yeah. to your soil. That's the key right there, isn't it? That is the key, slow release. So ultimately, you're not feeding the plant with the slow release nutrients. You're feeding the bacteria. Wow. So that really goes back to build healthy soil. Build a healthy soil soil. Nice. So I'm going to shift on you and I'd like for you to talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that failure and what you might have learned from it. Like I said, very difficult question, but I will say one of my biggest failures is not speaking up or not having the courage to speak up when I found out that a particular company was contaminating my community. Oh, One of the things that I've learned from it is that everyone has a voice. Everyone has the right to be heard, that you shouldn't be afraid to speak out, especially in the protection of humankind, even though that we are sometimes the ones that causes that disaster. You know, we should never be afraid of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so I would say that has been one of my biggest failures. It ultimately led to a lot of people in my environment or in my community getting cancer. Wow. That would be one of my biggest failures is being afraid to voice my opinion or speak up. Yeah. So I'll bet that's informed how you be moving into the future. Absolutely. You know, you only get one shot at this. What if it's face to face on Monday and you never just see that opportunity again for the rest of your life? You only get one shot at it. And I feel like that was my biggest learning experience is that although I was afraid to speak up, that what I learned is that you only get one chance. And from there, it just instill courage. Nice. And what do you consider your biggest success? My biggest success is definitely raising my seven-year-old daughter. It's almost like a dream come true where you've grown up, you've experienced so many things in life, and you wonder if you're ever going to get the chance to really tell the truth or pass on your story. And I think the biggest success for me is that I have started to put my daughter on a journey where she would be just as more passionate about me and saving the environment than I could ever imagine. Nice. And so I can kind of imagine what the answer might be on this next one, and that's What drives you? What drives me? I would definitely have to say individuality, ownership. Tomorrow definitely drives me because yesterday you always knew that there was something else to come. So definitely tomorrow always drives me. Wow. I'll tell you what, I haven't had that answer before or anything like that answer. I like it. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. If you could recommend one book for our listeners, what would it be and why? Oh, wow. I would definitely recommend to all of the biologists, the gardeners, urban farmers, scientists around the world to read a book called Silent Spring by the great Rachel Carlson. Yeah, that is a powerful book, isn't it? It's very powerful, especially when we can now sit on our front porch 
forward to walk around the community and actually see the things that she was bringing awareness of right. before you know some of us were even born and to understand that the problem has gotten worse it hasn't gotten better and we need more of those Rachel Carlson's you know today in the world yeah big time big time so what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners that advice <laughs> would be to live every day like you were dying. Ooh, say more about that. We tend to want to do all the things on our bucket list once we find out either we're ill, a loved one is sick, but every single day should be lived like you were dying. I truly feel like that's the only way that we can properly educate ourselves. That's the only way that we can understand each other. That's the only way that we can bring together cultures is that if we had the mentality as though the last day was today. Nice, nice, nice. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show today, Derek. Thanks for having me, Greg. You bet. So how can our listeners get a hold of you? So right now, you can either find us through various social medias, such as Facebook and Instagram. Our Instagram account is highcreations underscore AZ. Or if you want to read up more about us, just go to our website, which I mentioned earlier in the show at www.highcreations.com. And that's spelled H-Y-K-R-E-A-T-I-O-N-S. That is correct. Perfect. You can also find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org forward slash high creations two. And the reason it's number two is because we actually got to interview your business partner, Anthony Dominguez, and he had a lot to say about soil health too. So go and check out that podcast as well. We are your urban farming resource. You can find our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. Also visit urbanfarm.org to find articles, podcasts, webinars, courses, and more. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. Claiming your inner urban farmer is easy. Grow food, share it, and name your farm. Then let the world know you're an urban farmer while supporting our podcast. Pick up your urban farmer bling, hats, and t-shirts at imanurbanfarmer.com. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.